librarian, it goes to all of our public services librarians at once. So whoever is available the quickest and has the most um, subject knowledge on the question is able to jump on the question and get an answer to whoever asks um, in a timely manner. We also have our subject librarian page where um, people can reach out to the appropriate librarian via email for their, their question. And the other option here, book a research appointment. This is what uh, Amanda and I did. So, and I'll talk a little bit more about how Amanda and I initially met and then how we transitioned this research um, assistance process from, you know, what started out as a face-to-face -face interaction and then became um, an entirely, you know, remote interaction. So, um, Initially, I, I met Amanda, I would say just very briefly, in a library research workshop class that I did for Professor Fieldston's History of New York City, which is a fantastic class. And you would um, definitely notice that it's a popular class just by walking in the room because the I think the enrollment of the class is like what Amanda would you say like 25 26 people it's like yeah it's definitely in comparison to my English classes it's one of the biggest classes I've ever been in <laughs> yeah exactly it's like a really popular class and and it makes sense because I mean who doesn't want to learn about the history of New York City I mean in my opinion I think it's it's you know really fascinating and um it's also um, it was an honor to be asked to come in and to help support the research process by Professor Fieldston because this is um, something, especially because this is something that um, I've done a little bit of research on myself in my graduate school days, and um, I was just really excited to support them. So we started out by having a face-to-face -face library instruction class, and I remember speaking briefly with Amanda because, and I'll, I'll let you, you know, you know, introduce what your topic was because. Um, you know, I came over and you were you you did ask me a quick question and and do you, do you remember that interaction, Amanda? Yeah. yeah. So what I what the assignment is is it's like a guidebook assignment where you basically create on the website on the WordPress website it's like a tourist walkthrough of different events and places and people of New York City. Um, what I love about this class is it's not just like New York City, here's the history you've always known about the United States that you've gone through through high school and all your basic history classes. It's more so, here's the pieces of New York City that no one ever talks to, that uh, no one ever talks about. So the, the place that I decided to do was a hotel that I've been to a lot, which is the Latin New York pa uh, Palace. Um, and the interesting thing about that hotel is it has such an extensive, ornate history, but you, can't create the timeline really because a lot of it has become lost in translation. So a lot of my resources have become newspaper articles from the late 1890s all the way through the 1900s as the hotel became what it is today. And I've had to piece those newspaper articles together to kind of create my own timeline and be like, well, here's where the guy started and he decided to build these places and here's how it ended up becoming such a major expensive hotel that you can go and stay in. So the question that I had in the class was we started going through the research and because a lot of it was newspapers as an English major, I don't ever work with actual artifacts from the time period. It's a lot of people wrote about Dickens all the way back then and here's how we can relate it to today. Um, so a lot of the newspapers, I didn't know how to access them. I didn't know how to cite them. I've never done Chicago Chicago manual style. I've never done any of that. So this was, I've done a lot of research, but this specific field of research was very new and fresh to me. Um, so I think that was like the first question I ever asked you was I found an article and I was like, do you know who these people are and how do I find anything about them because they're nowhere? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And I remember that you had um, gone to the website for the Lot New York Palace, and you had found some really good background information about the history of it that, you know, spoke to the fact that it was originally built by Henry Villard and um, all of this stuff. But you were like, how do I get from like what's written here to like what I need from these, you know, primary sources that I'm being asked to find? 
Yeah. And yeah. So, and then, you know, fast forward to, that was what, probably back in like late January, early February, something like that. And fast forward to, you know, this time has gone by and this, you know, crazy time period, you know, this crazy crisis has, you know, begun. Um, and now we're in a completely new environment. And, you know, luckily, a lot of a lot of the resources that we needed were online. But I would say, you know, and we can now kind of, I think, together kind of talk about some of the the challenges and the successes of the research consultation process. But um, when when Amanda reached out to me via email um, in uh, March and said, you know, I'm, you know, having some trouble finding sources for this. It was one of the things that was really tricky was at that point in time, we had already been cut off from the library building itself. And one of the things that became apparent as we began researching was, okay, we don't have, like, there's, there's a perfect book on the Villard houses and it's in the library and it's a physical book and we can't get access it, to it anymore. So it's, it became, so what can we, what can we do in terms of what's entirely online? Um, but it was, I mean, yeah. And I mean, like, just kind of, you know, I'll, I'll, let, I'll let you put your own comments in too, Amanda. But I think, you know, we started out what saying we were going to talk for like 45 minutes. Yeah. And we <laughs> end up talking for almost two hours. Yeah. And, <laughs> and it's part of it was like, we were like, frustrated because we couldn't find the scholarly sources that you needed to fulfill the assignment. Um, because we were running against, we needed substantive scholarly sources that were talking enough about what you were trying to get at here. But then it was also um, kind of, I think towards the end, we went down this rabbit hole of finding these primary sources about, you're gonna have to remind me of her name. Leona. <laughs> Leona Helmsley. <laughs> the, the queen of mean okay. who and I'll let you I'll let you fill in a bit more of that too but um but yeah I mean it was you know it, it became a process of I think you know towards the end like we were starting to kind of forge like a, a personal connection there you know yeah no that's the one thing that I am very grateful that I've had with a lot of the people that I've come in contact with at Seton Hall is no matter where I am, what department I'm in, who I'm talking to, I always manage to form this really lasting connection that it makes everything 10 times easier. So the fact that we were able to fall down this rabbit hole together in the middle of a pandemic when I can't find any research for myself, <laughs> it really <laughs> made everything 10 times easier because I was able to find so many sources just because we both became so enthralled by this entire research thing that you didn't have to become involved with it at all to the extent that we became involved with it <laughs> but it's it made things a lot easier honestly I think it because I don't know if in person I would have necessarily come to the library and been like can you sit down and do intense research with me right now for two hours right I don't know if I would have done that myself but over the internet because you were able to share your screen with me and you were able to take notes that I still have today like almost two months later I it made everything 10 times easier for me and there was also this um this interesting thing that like you have been to this hotel before so you know you've been able to take these reference photographs and um, at one point in our research, there was a reference to Augustus St. Gaudens, who um, I happen to have a family connection to because someone in my family, um, you know, works on um, the Augustus St. Gaudens um, Museum. And so I happen to have like an intimate knowledge of this particular um, this particular sculptor who has pieces within um, the, the, the hotel. And so that actually ended up being a really crucial keyword that helped us unlock one of our scholarly sources. But it was this funny thing where after my conversation with Amanda that night, I had a phone call with that same family member scheduled and I was able to ask him 
you know, I noticed that Augustus St. Gaudens came up in reference to the Lot New York Hotel. And he said, oh, yeah, he was really instrumental in decorating the original hotel. And so that was a, like a happy kind of accident. And so I was able to follow up with Amanda after the fact and say, hey, you know, talking to my uncle, I was able to, you know, find some additional sources for us that way. Yeah, no, the I, like the background of the project is what you get from the website is very the most basic skeleton of the history of the hotel. It tells you who created it, why, who bought it like 70 years later and why. And then some other guy bought it a few years after that. It went through a little bit of a renovation. And now like some um, company from Seoul, uh, South, uh, South Korea now owns it. And that's how it's become who it is today. But the problem that we encountered was you can't find anything in between those like 70, 50, 20 year gaps. You can't find any actual sources. So we really did some digging to find those newspaper articles that were like here and there, like, oh, like the Villard houses are an option for the future was the name of one of the articles. Or Harry Helmsley bought the hotel and now he's turning it into this really massive place. We really had to do some intense research <laughs> to find what found to create it to where it is today for me to find all of this information to really lay out a timeline that otherwise is kind of lost in history. I wouldn't have I've stayed at this hotel twice and I never would have known that um, Henry Villard was literally run out of residence because he stole a bunch of his friends money and told them that he was investing it in some things and they were all going to get their money back. And then he went off and bought a railroad company in California. So I never would have known that, but because we found an article from like 1923, we kind of figured it out that that's how the archdiocese came to own it. The archdiocese still to this, to this day owns the property, but all these places are only renting the airspace and that's why there's a hotel there. I never would have known that because the people, when you go to the hotel, aren't going to be like, hey, we don't own this property, it's the church. Yeah. <laughs> and so I wouldn't have known that until I got these articles. and. If you look at my my bibliography, a lot of my sources are these little like New York Times articles written from like 1983 or a New York Times article written from 74. That's a, a big bulk of my research is these pieces of artifacts from that time period. Because like I said, there's no one sitting here talking about, hey, let's figure out why Leona Helmsley was so nasty and why nobody liked her. <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, I think you really brought new life to this story because of, um, you know, the way you stitched all of these little pieces. They, they, all of these pieces, uh, in terms of the sources, were sitting out there waiting for someone to find them. But I think you really brought new life to this project. And, um, you know, the, the link for your and uh, you, you've said to me that this is um, a work in progress, that you're still adding finishing yeah. touches to the guidebook assignment. But I mean, when I took a look at this last night, I was just, I was blown away. I mean, this is really, really cool to see this taking shape like this. So I'm just, I'm, you know, really kudos to you for stitching this all together into this really, really cool narrative of a building that has had, you know, a real, you know, change in life over its, you know, its period of existence. So oh, yeah. thank you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, thank you so much, Amanda. This was really, you know, a, a fun collaboration and, um, you know, a welcome distraction during these uh, these crazy times. So, okay, so I think that's it for our slides. And um, Chelsea, I'm gonna give control over to you. I think Chelsea's muted. Thank you. Hi, Chelsea. Hi, good morning, everyone. Hope you're doing well. Um, interestingly enough, I can't see how to navigate the slides here. I think so I can probably end up sharing my screen. I don't see it down here anymore. I think you can just click on this the slide to advance it. Yeah. Okay. Or possibly under that. All right. Um, good morning, everyone. My name is Chelsea Barrett. I'm the business librarian here at Seton Hall. As of January of this year, 
So you can imagine the initiation that I've had. <laughs> Within two months, I've been exposed to a pandemic, but we've been making it through. We have an excellent team here at the library, and I've also been working with a lot of professors and students and staff during this time, and it's been really interesting to see how the library can support during a pandemic, how prepared we already were and how much further we needed to go. So I hope to address this as well. I do have a student testimonial I will be discussing. Um, she couldn't be here, unfortunately, because she is actually representing Seton Hall in a competition today. So I will actually get to that in a little bit. If you have any questions for me, please field them to the chat and um, they can be addressed at the end of my presentation. So without further ado, let me get started here. All right. No, it's not letting me. Oh, there we go. <laughs> OK, so um, here on this slide, I've addressed three things that have really taken the most of my time, but also have also been really great for the library as a whole to help us fill in the gaps that we necessarily didn't have filled when this pandemic occurred. So I've gotten a lot of emails, a lot of correspondence with professors, students about databases. We have a lot of databases. And one of the excellent things that librarians do is we master these databases so that when you get your questions, we can say, OK, this is where you need to go. We have a lot of multidisciplinary um, databases where you can search many subject areas, but the issue that I've run into with a lot of students and faculty is they're getting assignments that have specific questions that need to be answered. In the business school specifically, we have quite a bit of specialized databases, so it's a huge mass of information and it says to me, how do I get them to get a clear roadmap to the answers to their questions. If you're able to do about 50 different things and you only have to look for one, that's where the request for tutorials and videos came in. So I've worked with a few students you know, via email and said, OK, this is how you do it, but it's not as easy as actually seeing it hands on, seeing it face to face. So I've been working with the chair of marketing and we are actually creating a database tutorial and a PowerPoint for one of his courses that are going to be taking place this summer. And it's on Euromonitor Passport. It is a wonderful, wonderful resource. It is constantly updated by data analysts in the field today. So it has updated information on COVID-19. It has updated information on all of the industries. And there is a lot that you can do. So it becomes a question of how do we actually navigate it? So we're actually working with his syllabus and his um, his course description and what he wants to do for this assignment so that we can actually create a video that is specifically geared toward these students. So that's been really excellent because it's given me an opportunity to see, OK, how are the professors actually teaching their courses? How do I actually build a database or a tutorial, not build a database, but build a tutorial that can actually help them get to where they need to be. So this has been really enlightening during this time. Working remotely on this has been a, a little bit more of a difficult thing only because myself and the professor can never really find a time to actually meet virtually. So we've been doing a lot of email correspondence, but it is in the works and I'm really excited to see how many more I can do in this pandemic time. So that is really wonderful. The next thing was the Bloomberg terminal license, and this actually translates a little bit to the student testimonial I'll be getting to. And I also did work with Brooke Duffy on this as well, um, not specifically with this, but with the student. So there are Bloomberg terminals in Jubilee Hall, but there's also one in the library and they're physically present there. So there's not really an online presence for the Bloomberg terminal and this is a wonderful piece of machinery. You get a lot of data like industry data real time and it's a little hard to navigate through, but once you do navigate it, you get a plethora of information that 
you know, is really important to have because if we are training our students and our faculty to actually perform in this time of heavy data usage, we really want to make sure that we have access to the things that we can provide so that they can get them. So this student actually wanted ESG data and unfortunately the library's um, databases and journals and all the resources we had couldn't get to the specific specified information that she needed. So I got in contact with just about every vendor I could think of. I got in contact with other schools and I ended up contacting the business school here at Seton Hall. And of course they have everything. So they told me that they have an extra license that they are willing to extend to the library so that we can have it if this ever happens again, which God forbid, but also just so that the, you know, if a student needs it and the library is closed for whatever reason, they can get access to this information. So I am working with three amazing faculty members in the business school to get this license available online. And once it is available, it'll be um, pretty much available for use for all students who need that type of data, which I would assume would be business students. But this is a wonderful thing and it really boosts the library and what we're able to provide. So I'm really excited about that. And the last thing is data inquiries. And we do have a data and ILL specialist. Her name is Seema, she's wonderful. So um, she can do more of the specialized data questions, of course, but I've gotten a lot of students who are saying, I'm doing a lot of my research now. How can I actually find the right data? How do I find the right data sets? And I had a student who reached out to me via email and she wanted to find out how many corporations are in New York City. And you would think it's easy. You just go into Google and say how many corporations are in New York City, but you actually don't get the answer very straightforward. And it took a lot of time for us to actually find the right data set that gave us the information that she was seeking. And you'd be surprised how many corporations are in New York City. So. That was um, very interesting to me and it showed me how I can do like a virtual appointment, but also do it via email correspondence just so we can cover all the bases. So these were three um, primary things that I've done during this time. So um, let's see. We also have the um, research guides on our website, which are fantastic ways to see what we do have available in conjunction with the guide that Brooke already discussed where we talk about a lot of the um, free online resources that we have which are located on that guide. So um, here we have you know the databases that we have which are always accessible online as long as you have the interface working and the platform working you're golden you can use those remote. We have journals but in um, my research guide there's also highlighted company information, industry information, where you can actually see the focused databases and journals that we have for that, but also other resources you can use that, you know, typically students would come to me in person and say, okay, how can I get here? Now it's here, you can look at it and find the information that you need. So we also have other, um, research guides down here which focus on each subject area in the business school and as the business school continues to grow this section will continue to grow so if you are a business student please take a look let me know if there's anything that you would like to see added any online resources that would help during this time I would greatly appreciate any input that you have I've also been helping um, faculty primarily, but also students with interlibrary loan assistance. So this is um, an email that I'm working on with a faculty professor. And this is his original research, so I did not want to reveal what he is doing, but we are working on getting him resources that um, would really boost his research during this time. And usually he would just come to my office. We would sit down, go through what he needed. Now it's more, okay, I had a thought at two o'clock in the morning. Can you help me with this? 
I've gotten emails at all hours of the night from him because he's on a weird schedule. And it's been really interesting to see how much more people are doing research now that they have all this time. So um, we've actually found quite a bit of information during this pandemic time, which um, I thought would be a lot less due to the lack of libraries being open and things being so chaotic. But libraries around New Jersey have really come together and gotten their operations in order, which is what Seton Hall has done as well. We are, you know, really trying to streamline our um, operations and get things done. And so far they seem to be working. We are always open to any questions as well or anything that you would like to see done. But this to me was a clear indication that we're on the right track. We're able to help with original research, which this has not been an easy task. It's kind of similar to Professor Duffy's inquiry with the student. It's like you get this question, how do you really find the information if there's not a lot out there? So it's been a fun time. It's been really fun and he seems to be happy. So we're just we're, we're still working on it, but it's been a great thing going forward. So the student that I've been working with, her name is Claudia Co. She's an MBA student in marketing and she's also graduating in May and I will miss her because I've only known her for three months, but she has been such a wonderful light. She is an ambitious student. She's been um, part of almost every business event that I've gone to. She's also a member of the CFA research challenge team, which is why she's not here today because they advanced to the next round as of Friday and they are competing today to hopefully make it to the next round. They are in the top 10 colleges in the Americas right now, and it has been many phases. They have done extremely well, and they have reached out to the library many times to get assistance, and in particular, I met her when I was working in person during one of her business consulting classes for her MBA. And we worked on getting data and information industry profiles for the company that she's looking into. But recently, her help has come from, okay, we're trying to advance in this challenge. How can we do that? What information can you give me? And she actually ended up reaching out to Brooke first. And then Brooke, transferred her to myself and another librarian, Lisa DeLuca. And we have been working to get her the information that she needed. And that actually prompted me to get the Bloomberg Business Terminal um, license. So she has been very instrumental in a lot of the things that I've been doing. I am so excited to have been working with her. She's such a wonderful student. So um, she sent me a very long, to, um, statement about how the library has helped her not only during this pandemic but prior so i picked out a few sections that i just wanted to talk about and um i hope that this illustrates what she you know really felt about the library because she is going to be watching this later i want to give it justice and mm -hmm. that is a picture of her in the back um that she provided and i have a few more so let's see there she is, that's Claudia. So um, her testimonial says, having met Brooke Duffy through the Shoe Library's website, Upgrade Initiative, I reached out to Brooke Duffy, who connected our team to Chelsea Barrett and Lisa DeLuca. With their support, we discovered a wealth of data the library has access to safely from home. Incorporating the ESG we found together had the desired impact. David Deneen, who serves as Portfolio Manager at Granahan Investment Management Inc., and our team's industry mentor agreed that the data enhanced our presentation greatly, and the judges agreed. An announcement from the CFA Institute Friday, April 17, 2020, shared that our team is in the top 10 schools in the Americas and will be competing in the next stage of the 2020 CFA Institute Research Challenge this Tuesday, April 21st. So congrats to the CFA team. Um, the library is very proud of you and you know they've worked so hard. They have been putting in all of the work. I've never seen people work this hard. They deserve every 
every accolade, every every step of the way, they have just been phenomenal. So um, once again, a huge congratulations to you guys. The library is honored to even have been able to help you in that way. And we hope to continue to help you as much as possible going forward. And there was another piece that I wanted to just highlight. So she said, furthermore, I had the pleasure of connecting with Chelsea Barrett, our business librarian through my business consulting course, where Chelsea assisted my team in finding industry data and insights at the co-hosted event by the Stillman School of Business and Seton Hall University Library's 14th annual Jim and Judy O'Brien Capital Markowitz Colloquium. I was connected to industry professionals to obtain feedback in preparation for our team's pitch at the 2020 CFA Institute Research Challenge. All in all, I have had such a wonderful experience with the faculty, students, staff, and librarians on campus, and I look forward to maintaining this connection in the future. Go Pirates! So, Claudia, I know you will be watching, so thank you very much for your testimonials. Thank you for being a wonderful light to the library. We are happy to have helped you, and best of luck going forward. Congratulations on graduating. So um, that is the end of my presentation. So I will be forwarding to Alan now. Thank you for your time, everyone. Okay, thanks so thanks. much, Chelsea. Professor Barrett, Professor Duffy, Professor Downey, and Professor Rose Wiles, it's tremendous working with such a tremendous team and you've just gotten two examples and more to come in terms of how these professionals are really affecting change in terms of like how people do research and also it's phenomenal in terms of being a collaborator with them in terms of different things. I'm just going to shift gears a little bit in terms of how the Archives and Special Collections Center, which is one of the university libraries, which is connected to Seton Hall, um, reacts to this particular crisis and how we provide research assistance offsite. It's a little bit challenging because um, a lot of our materials are primary source based, which means that they're in print form. We don't have everything digitized, which is a common question we have from people coming outside of campus. It would be great, especially at this time period with all this um, quarantine and people being off site. So we make the best do in terms of how we can provide the best possible um, information, you know, connections out there. So we rely a lot on the Internet and various other types of uh, reference works and so forth that I have here on site, which is very, very limited, but we do the best we can in terms of at least getting people started in the right direction. And I also added the graduate student experience. I have the great fortune of teaching a class for um, communication in the arts called um, Introduction to Archives for Museum Studies Professionals, which has really been a really tremendous class because we have various museum um, students who are representative of different disciplines within that field, registrar, education, um, curatorial, and so forth. And they're learning about archives and they're very well engaged. And um, we, had, we had live classes before the, um, the quarantine took hold and they've been very engaged in terms of doing video uh, classes and uh, outreach in terms of specific assignments that we do. But I'll get into more of that in a moment. So if I can uh, work my uh, fingers here, hopefully I can advance the slide. And I think it's went clicking once, right? Mm -hmm. Good. See, this is great. I'm surrounded by four librarians who can help me out if I can <laughs> get it going here. If you want, I can advance for you too, Alan. Thanks, Brooke. I appreciate it. OK. Oh, thank you so much. OK. OK, now basically two of our major vehicles our sites would be um, the Archives and Special Collections homepage, which I'll show you a screenshot in a moment, which sets up everything nicely in terms of a toolbar, various other uh, features of the interface that really help in terms of guiding the uh, user in different directions, which are hopefully uh, useful and helpful in terms of finding specifically what they need, uh, especially being, again, off-site at this point. And then we have various libguides. Um, Professor Barrett showed you one of, from business, which is great. And all the librarians, regardless of their liaison areas, have various libguides, which cover their major uh, subject areas, but also they branch off into uh, specifics as well. And we're no exception. We have ones that connect directly to archives and special collections. We have one on primary sources. We have a number of them on Catholic studies. And um, 
and the one I'll show you is uh, de devoted to university history. And the ones that are devoted to um, Catholic studies and university history constitute our major research question load. Before I was off site, I used to average roughly about two to three questions per day. And a lot of them are specialized, as I mentioned previously, about printed and primary resources. Some are a lot easier to, to um, facilitate than others. Some are very basic, like, do you have this specific book in your collection? I'd like to come by and look at it. No problem, back in the day. And then we get to that point again, where we'd be very happy to um, reinstate the on-site um, process of research. But with that said, we have other ones that are very involved, especially those involved with genealogy, those that are involved with student projects and so forth. And it's such a great benefit and a great um, honor to work with students and others who have different research projects. Because my motto is any type of question, there's no such thing as a dumb or stupid question. If somebody is seeking information or knowledge, it's so important to them. So that makes it important to me and it should be important to everybody else. Um, and that's why I always keep in mind whenever uh, going into a research question, and especially now at this uncertain time, this takes on greater gravity and uh, significance as we go forward. So let's see if I can, ah, good, okay, thanks. Okay, now here's the screenshot I promised you. This is our uh, university um, archives and special collections homepage. And you'll notice that the URL is up here, basically library.shu.edu backslash archives. And once you uh, approach the URL and you're on this particular screen, you'll see the uh, interface. We make it as user friendly as possible. And you can see in the toolbar various drop down menus. And the reason I drop down on resources is, especially in terms of being off site, electronic resources are really key in terms of having direct access and direct um, connection to things that are um, available right away. Digital collections is one of the wonderful things that we do. My colleagues in the archives have done amazing work in terms of uploading materials and so forth. Um, Sarah, Sheraton, Brianna, uh, Jackie, um, and in the gallery portion, Megan, Jean, and Ramana as well. So these individuals are really key in terms of making the operation a lot more fuller and that we have the resources we do have at this time, especially in terms of digital and various other um, information sources that we have available right here on our website. Then we also have subject guides, collections, genealogy resources, again, one of our major subject areas, Catholic resources and accessibility. But if you go to our site, you can always check out the other ones in terms of services, various libraries that we can connect to as well. We have a great working relationship with each of the libraries, um, even the archives at the law school, um, IHS, um, Professor Downey and the others up there are amazing to work with, as are um, those in the seminary and so forth. So we have all these things in place. And just to give you a um, more detail, especially in terms of our collections, which is a little bit interesting at this point, we do have a number of uh, finding aids on our site that connect to different subject areas. Many of our research questions come into me directly or through a vehicle. We have a uh, email request site, which goes by archives at shu.edu. So that's another source where um, people can lead their questions and uh, look for answers. Unfortunately, we're, we're kind of phone uh, handicapped at this point. So we try to do a lot by email in those two directions, uh, myself and this uh, site. What we also have getting back is this um, search engine here, which is called Archive Space. And we have a number of collections that you can look up according to a particular subject term, subject area, and so forth. And from there, you can get at least a sense of what collections are there. Unfortunately, it doesn't give more detail, but it does give a nice starting point if somebody's looking for you know, kind of like introductory information to a particular topic, subject area, or collection. Then down here, you have various aspects with links, which go by subject areas. It's sort of our introductory site, which helps out in terms of um, giving sort of like a basic overview of um, a particular uh, topic that somebody has in mind. The questions, again, come in in different ways and in different forms. One day, you, you know, never know what you're going to get. And some things are very interesting in terms of what's what's going on. For example, somebody had a question about, um, you know, uh, Edison cylinders 
which were recorded devices back in the uh, early part of the 20th century. We don't really have any in our collection, so it's a case of directing them to another uh, repository after double checking to see if we have had anything in our uh, holdings at this present time. So with that said, you know, it gives a sense of what we do have, and then if they have a question about somewhere else, we're happy to direct them in another, uh, another direction to another repository. And the one beautiful thing about the archives field is archivists are really keen and really in tune with each other in terms of what your holdings are and how um, people can help each other. So it's really a great uh, you know, collaborative in that regard as well. And then we also have our blog space. Again, my colleagues in the archives are tremendous in terms of Instagram and blogging at this point. I want to commend Professor Duffy for holding down the uh, library's Instagram account and posting, you know, very often in terms of things from the archives, the library and elsewhere, just to promote some of the things we have on site that can help you at this time. Um, so that's sort of like the home page, just in general terms, giving you sort of like a, a general overview of what's available. And for those of you uh, who are in tune here, just don't hesitate to uh, reach out to us and explore the site in more detail, if you wish. Okay, great. Okay, and this is an example of one of our um, lib guides or reference guides. Uh, this is the one on university history that we maintain. And this one has been particularly helpful at this time, especially those who have questions regarding Seton Hall history. Probably our most um, active researchers are from the athletic department, um, advancement, and I would say alumni affairs in most, most cases. But again, it varies from day to day, question to question, and also from topic to topic related to school history, but el anything outside of that as well. So basically what we try to do is give an overview of the history of Seton Hall. We have a link there that connects to um, a general history, which goes from 1856, our founding date, all the way up to 2019, the late part of the year. Unfortunately, we didn't have a chance to update it for this particular uh, pandemic, but at the same time, this will be added as well. And then we have various links to collections, but also other sites on the internet. Various things have been digitized through um, the Hathi Trust, Google Books and so forth that have a Seton Hall imprimatur on it. So we've done that in terms of trying to link as well. And another source book that's been very invaluable across the board is um, uh, the Catholic Church in New Jersey, a 1904 volume by Joseph Flynn, which is fully digitized outside out of uh, Cornell University. And these particular things have been really incredible in terms of having background research options available, especially from an online perspective. And then we have other things on this particular site. But if you go to the University Library's homepage proper, and the drop down menu under research help, that should really be able to help you out in terms of finding specific ones related to a particular topic that is being researched at this time. So these give you some of the visual perspectives that we have been working on in terms of um, helping our uh, research clientele. So let's get into some testimonials and some specifics that I've been involved with and, uh, and collaboratively over the last uh, few weeks. Okay. Now, I talked about the class Introduction to Archives Management and Museum Professionals. Um, sorry for the, the lot of text on the screen, but I just wanted to give you a sense of um, the purpose of the class. In uh, specific terms, it's basically to give museum professionals, again, a look at the archival science profession from different uh, perspectives, administration, historical management, and so forth. And just to give you a sense of how it's been helpful, and again, collaboration, um, we had uh, Professor Ince and Professor um, Sharif uh, uh, Shama, who has um, given like presentations in the past um, for our class, which have been invaluable in terms of helping us out at various points. And we've also had uh, guest speakers from different uh, institutions, Rutgers, Princeton, uh, and we have another one coming up from a gentleman from the Newark uh, Museum as well. So all this gives good perspective and good um, analysis and good collaborative um, energy to this particular class. It's been very helpful. And we have 13 students and um, actually we've had perfect attendance, which has been uh, really great from our um, first online class in late March all the way up to the present day. And then I just wanted to point out one of the more recent assignments, the midterm essay. Now this has been interesting because I've had a lot of emails back and forth from students who are looking at having their topics um, reviewed, 
Um, the way I look at it, if they have a valid um, topic area in mind, I, I, I support them as much as I can and try to give them leads and also how to do the research themselves in terms of finding more precise information, especially from a primary source or archival perspective. So it's been really rewarding in various ways in terms of seeing what these students have come up with in the recent uh, past. So that's just an overview of the class. Now we get into um, some of the topics that have been um, talked about. So as you can see here, it's an interesting range of um, topics that have been chosen. I particularly like the, Le the Lego Group Historical Archive that somebody created. Basically, they're trying to create a um, repository from scratch. They're putting in um, basic collecting policy, mission statement, and other types of documentation that'll help their uh, repository take off the ground. But also at the same time, they're looking at examples that they can have in terms of their collecting focus and what they're going to specialize in from a broad-based perspective. Um, for example, the Museum of Sharks, in terms of the history of, um, you know, how sharks evolved in terms of a um, scientific approach, but also in terms of how sharks have been documented in terms of um, human existence, in terms of not only attacks, but also in terms of popular culture, in terms of literature, in terms of other types of things that would give it a full effect in terms of what they're looking at in terms of their respective repositories. Not only from a primary source perspective, but from an overall perspective to help their constituencies in terms of their research audience, in terms of making their sites stand out more. So each of these have been worked on with the students, and it it is pretty uh, broad. It's pretty wide range of different uh, items in mind, and they've been all really interesting in terms of what they've come up with in various ways. And these are just some of the guest speakers again, Professor Al Sharif and uh, Professor Ince, who have been tremendous in terms of sharing their time and talents with us. Okay, okay, this is our first. Um, that's our second. If I can go more. There we go. Okay, uh, one of our uh, students who allowed us to use her name and her uh, title and her uh, testimonial, Samantha Becker. Basically, she's just given an overview of uh, the research methodology exercise and how she um, approached it. She went to different estates after discussing with her. And again, I should point out that archival repositories, there's many different types. There's academic, there's um, commercial, there's uh, corporate, there's museum-based, there's public history, there's um, historical societies and so forth. And um, I said, and I brought it up specifically because archival networks are key. If some institution doesn't have a particular subject area, they move on to another one. And then, you know, again, it's the collaboration working its best magic in terms of helping people out, especially, again, being offsite at this time. And um, Ms. Becker has really put together various things. She's also come up with different collecting policies she's found online to highlight her unique uh, perspective as well in terms of um, basically the gallery archives, the no say uh, archives, and how she created it and what she went through in terms of what she found. And just a brief overview of her uh, path to that particular discovery in the, at this particular time. So she's been really energetic about what she's found and, and presenting it to the public here. So I'm happy to have her testimonial. And I'm also happy to have the testimonial of Professor Chris McGonigal, who's actually gives a good perspective because he's not only an adjunct in the English department, but he's also a student in the class who's given a lot of great perspective in terms of what he's looking at. Um, and he allowed me uh, access to his uh, testimonial and name as well. So basically, as you can see here, He's talked about like uh, archival classes that he's taught. And also this is a shout out to all my colleagues again in the library, the faculty, the administrative, the staff. Actually, again, it's a whole process in terms of having everybody's talents and expertise working together. Um, so these classes have gone a little bit outside of our archival box, so to speak. But at the same time, it's really rewarding to see how they have gone from that launch pad of what we have and then going into different directions, but also in terms of what we have to offer, if not if not actual materials, advice and guidance in terms of going the next step. 
So as you can see here, he basically uh, has taught classes and online community, and basically he's working on book reviews as well during his time here. And I've been talking to him a little bit about some of the volumes and access, if we have eBooks or not, in terms of what's available. And uh, he's actually looking at various archival projects down the road, especially in terms of graphic arts and things in that particular realm of a study. So uh, Professor McGonigal will be a great uh, asset and a great researcher to us in the future as well, just like he is today. OK, and this is my last slide. Basically, this gives a few specifics about how we're doing, and it just reinforces what I've been saying about posing the challenge. Um, contextual data is very key. If you don't have the specifics, you try to find as much as possible. Along with saying that no question is unimportant, it's really key to be as thorough as possible, especially in archival primary source research. Oftentimes I've done uh, homework assignments through the classes on an undergraduate level um, in terms of having assignment choices available to the students, which have been really rewarding and really um, tremendous in terms of the output. But with that said, you know, if we can at least at this point provide um, context or a broader base and then like pull together whatever information is possible, it really helps in terms of at least having that available to the student so they have something to work on and work from. Now, basically, faculty research initiatives. I mentioned athletics is one of our great constituencies. This was an interesting challenge. They wanted an overview of the 2000 baseball team, which made it to the World Series that year. Um, and they did very well in the Big East tournament. So I just had to work with the internet and um, our uh, yearbook database and some other sources to try and piece together some of the things that worked with this particular request. And fortunately, we were able to also get um, a roster of the team and also the results, which were really key in terms of at least giving them the foundation or the basics that they needed to progress forward. Also, one of the rewards is, and I mentioned this earlier, is that each of the librarians here on campus have a, a liaison or liaison areas. Uh, mine happen to be religious studies, philosophy, military science, um, Catholic studies, and, and the like. So I've been working with philosophy in terms of lib guides for specific courses at this time, which have been very rewarding and very helpful. Close contact with the professors as well. Not only uh, library resources, but I try to put in a plug for archival resources. Even last night, the unit we uh, talked about was PR, public relations, promotion, and developing news about your archive. So we try to get the word out about our resources. It may not fit neatly in every subject area, but let me just say that at this point, um, there could be some other types of tie-ins. Say you're looking at a particular course in science, for example. Science doesn't usually lend itself to um, the archival repository here on first glance. However, if you dig deeper, various research projects in terms of the history of the science department, biology, chemistry, and so forth, the very first PhD students in, 1960, in the 1960s uh, on campus, doctoral students were from the chemistry department, for example. Even looking back in history, in terms of the early science classes, what were the reading lists? What text did they use? We have lists of all this information, and these are things that can be developed regardless of your subject area. So I sound like a commercial message, So, but at the same time, the, the goal is to get the information out there and have it uh, reference for people to use if they see fit to uh, progress forward. And then military science. Um, before the uh, off-campus um, status hit, I was working with them in terms of getting a guidebook together for the Revolutionary War battles of Trenton and Princeton, um, which was going to be a field trip. But that's on hold for the present time, uh, as most activities are. And then working on sort of like a profile of the generals, um, the basic uh, strategy of the conflicts, and different types of milestones and markers for these particular um, battles, which were turning points within the Revolutionary War. And um, these have been some of the major ones, along with others that have come on along the way. And the one thing I will also add here, and I know there's going to be a Peter Schein presentation on it, it's the um, oral history COVID-19 uh, project that's going on through the archives um, and throughout the university library with a lot of great help from different individuals. So if you go to the university library's homepage and even uh, the archives and special collections page, you'll see a link 
how students, faculty, and others can record their um, um, experiences during this time of crisis. And it would be really helpful in terms of the historical record and working forward. And just my parting words are basically history comes in various forms and we try our best to help out individuals who are out there. So we'll see what happens in the future, but at the present time, it's just been a real um, inspiration and a real benefit working with my, um, my colleagues in the library and in the archives, but also in terms of the general public, students, faculty, administrators who have been seeking requests. And we go forward and we, um, we work to make it the best possible experience for everybody. So I'm finished and I'm going to hand it off to Professor Downey right now. So, okay, Kyle, if you can request. Yep. yep. Okay, and you are in. Okay. Let's see if I can go back one slide here. Here we go. It's a little slow. OK, well, thank you, Alan, for the introduction. Um, and thank you to my colleagues, Chelsea and Brooke, for excellent presentations. It's just awesome seeing what my colleagues um, in the library here at Seton Hall are doing for their students um, and in faculty as well. Um, it's really important at this time because this transition has not been easy for everybody. Um, there's also you know, been limits to technology, access to internet. That's definitely certainly made some things a challenge. Um, but to give an introduction, my name is Kyle Downey and I am the IHS Health Sciences Librarian, one of the three librarians on the IHS campus located in Nutley. Um, I work along with my colleagues Allison Piazza and Annie Hickner, who are actually the liaisons to the School of Medicine. Uh, my liaisonship is specifically with the College of Nursing and the School of Health and Medical Sciences. Um, but we've all worked very closely along with the Associate Dean and Director of the library, uh, Chris Duffy, to provide our students and faculty with the resources needed um, during this crazy transition to working from home and learning from home. Um, so we've been trying to provide our students with all um, resources that we can possibly do by updating our toolkits, by promoting our services through several email um, outreach uh, links, and just really trying to get the faculty and students to know that we are here for them um, to, during this crazy transition. Um, similar to the uh, SHU library website, the IHS library website has also created a library remotes um, services page, which also includes access to PubMed as well as their uh, health science databases, uh, electronic journals or ebooks, uh, information on interlibrary loans. We have blogs that talk about the COVID-19 experience and resources uh, for COVID-19 that are constantly being updated. Um, we also provide, of course, contact info for the liaisons themselves. Um, and of course, we also have a IHS library uh, email that we all maintain and um, supervise in case there's questions from either faculty or students. And then we appoint those um, email questions to the proper liaison um, to get the quickest and um, most appropriate response to the student or faculty. Um, again, we've also um, provide research assistance, um, searching for books, searching for articles um, for the research for both faculty and students. Uh, we develop research topics, uh, conducting background research, foreground research based on any kind of clinical questions. And we also help, um, especially students, especially on my end too, um, with Khan and Shem's um, citations, uh, bibliographies, uh, reference questions um, based on references. Um, for example, like AMA or APA, and of course, how to use Zotero. So let's see if I can. So I'm going to talk about, um, you know, about our toolkits or what we um, call as toolkits. Everybody else calls them research guides, so um, they go hand in hand. Um, and we'll also talk about uh, the School of Medicine and then their involvement. Um, their involvement with elective courses, with uh, student involvement with the clinical teams at Hackensack Meridian Hospital. And um, we also talk about uh, the elective webpage, which we should have a picture of later on. Um, we'll also, also talk about the College of Nursing and the School of Health and Medical Sciences and how we've been um, helping them out as well. If you have any specific questions um, later on about the School of Medicine, I'll try to answer those um, to the best of my ability. I know. Uh, what they do pretty well, um, but they could, if you have any very specific questions, um, we can hold it off to the end um, and I'll be glad to help out with that. So 
On March 23rd, uh, the School of Medicine launched um, some elective courses for students to participate in. Um, these courses are considered pass or fail for credit as part of the students in their phase two learning. Um, there can be up to eight students per elective per of these elective courses. Um, for example, our librarian Allison um, is actually a member of and working with the students in two of these elective courses, um, the two being the COVID-19 elective and a course on bioethics uh, medical crowdfunding elective. Um, the COVID-19 elective, for example, consists of several objectives, which would be um, like developing, developing focused and answerable clinical questions about the emerging best practices in COVID-19 currently. Um, search for evidence in gray literature, sources um, that may be relevant to COVID-19. Appraising COVID-19 evidence that has been found. And then cont uh, contribute to the creation, dissemination, application and translation of the new healthcare knowledge and practices for COVID-19. Um, these elective classes are co-led by uh, Chris Duffy, the Associate Dean at the IHS Library, as well as um, Dr. Jeff uh, Voskamp, who is the Vice Dean at the School of Medicine. Um, they supervise and help the students out with some of these research, with this research. So here is um, what the elective page looks like. Um, this slide actually, I should have updated it this morning, um, as of right now, it's been visited probably over 3,900 times. So it's, it's seen an increase of uh, over 900 views since um, I posted that. Um, it's certainly one of the busiest um, web pages that we have on the library in, uh, overall, um, basically because of what's going on. Um, as you can see here, um, these are the best practice reports that are placed in very specific tabs. So critical care, guidelines, imaging, evaluation, et cetera. Um, these reports are written by the second year med students, um, which is very, very impressive. Um, they have conducted very thorough and extensive literature searches using um, the best evidence based practice searching techniques taught by the library. Um, so this particular page is constantly being updated by the librarians uh, when students submit their summarized reports that have been initially prop and properly reviewed by doc uh, Dr. Boskamp, of course. Um, again, it's very impressive. I r highly recommend um, when you have the time to check out these uh, best practice reports just to see how they're well they're written and researched. It's extremely impressive um, how well they've conducted their literature searches and um, appraised this literature um, and of course being reviewed. And it's just absolutely impressive. Right now, I think there's about 60 reports published total. So it's very impressive work. Um, and we do have a testimonial that um, Chris had sent me on uh, one of the students' experiences um, working with this. Um, Austin Cribs, he said, I'm finding the task force work extremely satisfying. All the reading is making me more knowledgeable as far as COVID-19 goes, knowing that my work has the potential to go directly to clinical teams and impact healthcare is incredible. Um, he also said, searching for answers regarding nursing home discharges um, on Monday only emphasize how vulnerable or, con or valuable our contributions can be. The deadline made everything much more real and I did my best job to comb through the literature with help, of course, to subtly answer a, a deceptively simple question in a timely manner. So I uh, thank you, Austin, for that testimonial. Um, you know, the students uh, were added to the clinical teams in Hackensack to provide real time answers and information support. So they had contact directly with these um, with the clinicians on at the campuses uh, at the hospitals um, through uh, WhatsApp to communicate um, amongst each other. And they also had five, uh, daily 5 p.m. calls uh, really to report on what's going on um, and of course t talk about real time questions that needed to be answered. Um, so again, like I said, these reports have been published currently as at 48, but as of now, it's over 60. So um, these are clinical questions that need to be answered in real time. This is students gaining experience for doing research that's been um, promoted and taught by um, the librarians on the IHS campus. So it's really um, great to see that the students are taking what they've learned from the library and the library sessions um, and incorporating it into best practice reports that really could be helping these uh, and are helping these clinical teams that are on the front lines right now um, at Hackensack and the other hospitals. And it's just impressive work and the students 
Um, and the librarians, Allison and Andy and, and Chris, of course, should be very proud of what they've um, conducted and uh, put together in such a short period of time. Um, you know, this hit the IHS just like it hit every other academic building pretty hard. Um, you know, I wish that I before I left campus, I was I could grab some of the reference books that I needed, um, particularly like the APA book. I should have snabbed that before leaving. Um, uh, but, you know, we may do with what we can. A lot of research in health sciences in medicine and nursing is online anyway. Um, so that's a big benefit to us is that, um, you know, most of the research conducted by any kind of clinician or nurse or doctor uh, or anyone in health sciences really has to be very recent research. So we're not driving, going back into databases several years or going into archives or anything that initially to answer like these strong uh, clinical questions. So um, it, it's been a benefit for us. That a lot of our material has been um, online or is online or journals or databases, um, all our resources and tools. And um, it's that's it's been provide it's been great. The one challenge that I definitely has occurred is that some of the texts that students have been using, um, some of the required texts, are only in print. Um, their electronic versions are behind very expensive paywalls of other um, vendors that unfortunately may not have given us any kind of discount or anything like that, like others may have. But uh, we've worked around that to some extent. I've worked closely with faculty to find supplemental. Uh, material, uh, whether it be other books, um, videos, or articles to uh, supplement the material that they may just not have access to in person. So uh, let's move on here. So I will now move on to my liaisonship, which is, of course, the School of Health and Medical Sciences and the College of Nursing. Um, like many others have discussed, uh, based on there's this transition from working from on campus to working from home. Um, every, all of my interaction has been done remotely. What have been through email, um, Microsoft Teams, of course, or through phone calls. Um, yeah, it's been certainly challenging at times, but at other times it's been really successful. I've definitely, like as Brooke has mentioned in her presentation, that you develop these personal connections that you may not have otherwise developed while working on campus, which may sound weird at first, but Really, like I spent on the phone for an hour talking to a nursing graduate student about not just her research paper, which included like she didn't understand exactly where to go with her PICO question, which is a clinical research question, um, to start off her research paper. But then we also talked about her experience working in the hospital. She is a nursing graduate student. She um, has very limited time to actually conduct research right now um, and do schoolwork in general because she's asked to work on the front lines. Um, I unfortunately couldn't get her testimonial because this whole weekend uh, she was swamped at work. So, um, but she asked me to like at least talk about our interaction. And so um, it has been really important to um, hear what these students are going through, these nursing students, the ones that are on the front lines. Um, and um, they're overwhelmed for sure. But we do our best as a library to provide that instruction. That's what it gave me the initiative to really Stay, stay on the phone with her and go through these um, research questions in real full detail because in person you may only talk for half an hour or so and that's it. But it, it gave me the time to really go through uh, the, her questions very thoroughly and understand the challenges that are going on. So Again, like my main form of consultations with students in general have been through Microsoft Teams or direct phone calls. Um, after receiving a number of similar questions, I decided to re rework um, my evidence-based nursing guide, which is located on the IHS li library website, to use, as, to use it as a reference with my students. Um, this, this time working from home has given me really the time to reflect on what um, my toolkit um, provides. Um, I've been looking at other toolkits. I've been reading articles to try to compile a better thorough um, toolkit for these students to use, as well as faculty to use um, for, their, their, for their classes. Um, fortunately, um, in the instruction aspect of things, most of my instruction generally occurs in the beginning of a semester. Um, so for the spring semester, it's gen generally January to maybe early February. Um, so Fortunately, I did get to do most of my um, formal instruction uh, with my classes, both in Shenzhen Khan 
um, prior to this outbreak and prior to being forced to, to be working from home. Um, obviously, that doesn't mean that all my instruction has been conducted, just most of it. Um, and of course, with the summer coming, the summer is very uh, big with instruction load for me um, as courses start in the um, PT program and a couple other programs in July. So uh, we have to keep that in mind that that's coming about soon, sooner rather than later. And we don't know what's going to be happening in the next few months. So it's important for me to um, be prepared for that. Um, but other than that, during the semester generally, um, I make many appearances, what I call the mini appearances to classes. Um, faculty will invite me back to do maybe a slight refresher of the content that they're going over in their classes. This doesn't include like a formal like half an hour or an hour lecture by any means, but it includes me usually going up there and talking for 10, 15 minutes about a particular resource. For example, in OT, going over background information like how to access background information, what's the best way to do that, what is background information. Um, and then I usually walk around, I usually, when in the course this is in person, walk around the classroom and help students out that are conducting their research. Um, so I can be invited to that through Microsoft Teams to do kind of a similar approach to that. Um, but it's made it great because now I can share my screen and show these students um, how to search these things more thoroughly and more properly than may I have had in, in person. Um, so let's see. OK, so one of the. Um, let's see. Go back here. Yeah. OK, good. Um, so one of the biggest consultation um, Requests I've been getting lately is actually from the PhD students. Um, I got um, permission from Michelle here to um, talk about his research for a little bit um, because he's been he heavily involved in the research on his topic, which is exploring and understanding the physical activity and sitting behavior among Saudi students in the United States. States a re research descriptive study. Um, so we actually met actually in person several months before this um, outbreak occurred. So I already had some kind of connection with him um, prior to this. But uh, we've been consulting each other and helping each other do research for his topic, um, which is very in-depth research. Um, and he just he's been really um, supportive of like just reaching out to me and I've been trying to do my best to be supportive and provide any kind of um, advice and research. So obviously with this quote here, our virtual consultations both save me time, my time and effort, as well as helping me find the proper research for articles. Um, this is just one example of a PhD student that I've been helping and more PhD students as of this week and last week, I've been reaching out for assistance as well. Um, so it's, you know, the dissertation, the dissertation process is a long and tedious effort. Um, being able to support these students and all students with the research questions that they have with this technology actually makes it doable. Um, I've also helped like dis dissertation research on how to find information on genetics. For example, um, a dissertation on the BRCA gene, a gene that's found um, related to women in breast cancer, um, as well as um, meeting with students to discuss like the searching process, as well as collaborating with graduate students on pulling together PhD sources um, who are beginning a literature review. So it's working with students on all sorts of different little projects, um, which are also helping educate themselves by working on these projects together. Um, this includes putting together lit articles on the literature review process or videos discussing literature review process and providing access to t textbooks on this process as well. So other vir virtual references during this time from home have included one-on-one -on -one sessions using Microsoft Teams on searching databases, conducting literature reviews. Um, other, specifically, some students and faculty, for that matter, want to know more about the new layout or interface for the new uh, PubMed, which is, um, was rolled out a few months ago. Um, some students and faculty have still not jumped quite on board on the aspect of its changes, but um, this has given me the opportunity like it has back when it back in February and January to go through the new PubMed um, to show what has changed, what hasn't, um, and you know go over some things that they may not be too familiar with in general, which is including 
like the MeSH database, which is in PubMed, the medical subject headings. Um, for all that intents and purposes, you know, it's similar with CINAHL or other health science databases, Science Direct or Scopus, um, really to get these um, students and faculty to see the um, education they need on how to access these databases, and how to use them. Um, of course, um, Zotero has been another major um, uh, session through Microsoft Teams to teach both faculty and students again on how to use it properly. Um, a lot of the faculty are still not too familiar with the aspect of in putting the citations into like a Word document. So that's been one thing that um, I've been showcasing with them, giving an example of a document, and how to incorporate your references into um, uh, using Zotero into your Word document as well. Um, of course, a lot of reference questions um, lately as we get further into the semester and research papers are uh, soon to be due, um, of course, about the AP format. Um, of course, some of you may know that the APA format has um, been updated to the seventh edition back in the late fall. And um, but some faculty are still using the sixth edition and are planning on incorporating the seventh edition um, this coming fall semester instead. Um, so the questions can be really confusing, but sometimes you have to make sure you ask the student like, OK, what is your professor requesting? Sixth edition, seventh edition. Sometimes the student doesn't know if it go back to the professor and ask. Um, but we put up an excellent blog on how um, what what has changed with the seventh edition. And of course, for very specific, very thorough questions, which is why I regret not, not grabbing that reference copy before leaving the IHS campus, um, it's like um, showing the students the Purdue OWL guide on the APA format, and they've updated that, and it's an excellent resource for both faculty and students to use, um, as well as that actually Zotero is updated with 7th edition of APA as well. So you can really show them examples of like, oh, here's what a six, um, APA 6 reference looks like, here's what a 7th reference looks like. Um, so those are a very the common virtual questions that I've been getting. Um, oh, I think one of my slides is not here. But um, I had another slide about um, just one more faculty member that I had reached out to, um, Rudy Halbert from the OT, um, OT research methods class, who I've also worked very closely with um, to go over how to do advanced searching in PubMed and um, other databases. Basically, for many like systematic reviews um, that the students are conducting in their courses, of course, um, it's more of a very thorough literature review than a systematic review, but it, we do go through the process um, of learning how that's conducted. And um, he did send me an, um, a nice testimonial. Uh, I guess it's not here, but it's okay. It's totally okay. Um, about uh, you know how we've worked together very closely using Microsoft Teams and how we use the um, shared software to go over these very thorough searches um, in in together over virtual reference to really e explore how to um, get this proper research for the students. Um, in the end, though, like there is many um, successes and challenges to this. Um, so the success, of course, is like most of the material, like I said, is online or ebooks or e-journals or databases. Our Microsoft Teams makes it possible to provide instruction, reference and consultation. And of course, like um, Brooke said, and like I mentioned earlier, developing connections with students that may not have happened otherwise. Um, and, you know, it's been great getting to know these students and getting the really know these students as we've been home week after week. And like I said, some of the challenges, of course, are um, that some of the text, especially required text, may not have any electronic version, or if they do, it's not a version that we can get access to. Um, and of course, you know, we don't know the lack of lack of Internet access that students may have from home uh, that does not make any research or um, assignment possible. So that's definitely a challenge that's, you know, nationwide, of course. Um, but um, so that's my experience um, working as the one of the health science librarians on the IHS campus, um, you know, working from home and helping students and faculty conduct research, access to materials, making sure they have access to everything they need um, and then you know reaching out to them constantly to make sure that they know the library is there um, to support them for anything they may need so um, i will pass it on to lisa rosewiles professor lisa rosewiles and the question control so thank you everybody 
Uh, right. Well, thank you everybody for staying with us this long during this very busy time. Um, I'm Dr. Lisa Rose Wiles. As probably many of you know, I'm the liaison for the sciences. Uh, thank you, Dr. Delosia, for the shout out to chemistry as our oldest PhD program. I'm also a psychology, anthropology, sociology, social work, the core, LGBT, and the Lonergan Institute. So I have rather a nice, diverse range of liaison areas. And I think my colleagues have done just a really terrific job of giving you a sense of the enormous diversity and range of things that librarians do and how we work with students and faculty in research. Um, there were also a few references that I'll say a little bit more about some of the technical difficulties. I have to say, in my case, probably well, definitely the first week of work from home and most of the second week as well. A huge amount of my time was spent working with faculty who are having difficulty with teams with the online environment. And I had to laugh a little bit about this that they were turning for me to help, which I called the one eyed leading the blind because um, thanks to Brooke Duffy's excellent work on getting us up up and running very quickly with teams and the fact that we worked on campus longer than other faculties so we actually had more training time we were sort of seen as as experts on doing teams which i think was far from the case for me it was very much a learn as we went situation um but that was interesting learning how to navigate the online environment kind of a half a step ahead of many of our faculty and it also um, let me get to know a lot of people that I hadn't really worked with that much before. But really, I wanted to switch gears a little bit with this. Let me just see if I can get my slide to move forward. Uh, there we go. And <clears throat> whoops. I got ahead of myself there. Um, talk not so much about the research process and working with students and faculty on research, although I've certainly done a lot of that but really about something broader that I think all our faculty are doing and librarians are in a really good space to do because we do meet with such a diversity of students. And that is simply being there, reaching out to students, giving them a chance to talk, in some cases just to vent, ask them how they're doing. And I find that so many of our students and many of our faculty too, just really need this chance to connect with somebody, even though virtually. Um, I tend to think before this, you know, that our students who are on social media all the time and they're also adept at all this communication thing online and that being physically isolated wouldn't be such a big deal. And I was really surprised to learn how troubling it is for many of them to be isolated, particularly those who are um, away from home and in difficult situations. Kyle mentioned speaking with a nursing student who is actively on the front lines as a nurse. I've been working with students, um, one of whom is in the, um, the, the office end of providing um, deliveries for grocery stores and so on, dispatching trucks and so on. She's an essential service worker. She's been working 12 to 14 hour shifts and trying to do her schoolwork and her entire family is quarantined with COVID. Um, I have another student who is um, a student athlete who has no idea where his funding is coming from, who is working as a pizza delivery um, driver, um, delivery guy to make ends meet. I have a lot more stories like that of, of students that I'm working with who are really going through difficult times. And we do, of course, talk a little bit about schoolwork and research and so on, but really a lot of this comes down to something that my amazing colleague Marisa Case, who's in freshman studies, gave a, a faculty retreat presentation on this, I think, last year. And she talked about this concept of attentive listening as an act of love, as part of our Catholic mission, as simply paying attention to what our students and our faculty are saying to us and simply just by being present is, I think, very important. And this kind of personal and honesty and openness is part of intellectual 
honesty and openness, I feel it, it's hand in hand with the same thing. It's as my friend Linda Garofalo likes to say, you know, if you're going to talk the talk, you need to walk the walk. You need to be open and honest, both personally and intellectually, by which I don't mean sharing your running out of toilet paper stories, but um, letting students know that we too are very challenged and scared and have a lot of doubt about going forward. Of course, from a library perspective, I always have to get in this piece about, you know, try to keep away from the social media hype and misinformation that's out there and stuff that's only going to stress you out and direct people to a reliable sources. That's something that, of course, as librarians, when we teach doing research is absolutely high on our list is not just the technical nuts and bolts of how to exercise um, doing research, but how to evaluate what you're looking at. So my bottom line through all of this has really been staying connected to let folks know that all of our librarians are there for you. I, as several people have said, you know, I get emails at two o'clock in the morning. I'm actually working much longer hours than the long hours that we typically work because I am often on email late at night and weekends and so on. The other thing I, I tell our students who are interested, and a lot of them are, um, I belong to a contemplative pedagogy group here on campus, as do several of our librarians. And pointing out that despite all the anxiety and worry and uncertainty of these times, it really is an ideal time for meditation. If you're into meditation, I meditate each day. I find it very helpful. We have a virtual meditation group now. We just started this week and reflecting on what it is you're doing on interiority, on thinking about not just grades and jobs and finances and all those real world worrying things, but really going deeper into what's going on with you inside. The last thing I want to do, and this is this is going to be familiar to some people, um, pets are really important at this time. I am privileged to have four um, feral rescue cats, one of whom, Mr. Patches, has been enthusiastically participating in all of my classes and meetings. This started from the very first when he was just fascinated by um, the voices and images coming out of the computer. So I think I'm going to go live. Excuse me a second, Mr. P. It's appearance time, sir. So this is whoops. <clears throat> Did I um take the It's okay. No, uh, I'm gonna stop now? sharing for a moment because whoops. Okay, I want to get rid of the PowerPoint and go live here. Brooke, are you ah here we go. All right, let me bring up the said. Here is Mr. Patches. Mr. Patches. I don't know if everybody can see Mr. Patches, but Mr. Patches, I, I see Professor Murtag is in happily joined us, so he can attest to that Mr. Patches has been one of the most faithful attendants in all the classes that I work with and I'm embedded in and meetings and so on. We've um, we offer virtual per sessions as well as research sessions. He's a very mellow big cat, as you can see. And this is a really nice <clears throat> icebreaker, I think, for classes and for students. It humanizes things and it's encouraged not just students, but some faculty as well to introduce their own pets. I had a really nice session the other day with a faculty member and a, a couple of students where we introduced our cats and dogs to one another. So I think this is a way of keeping it real, keeping people a little more in touch with the things that really matter in life, being close, being in contact, showing support and love for one another. And on that note, I think we will um, wind up and open up for questions. If you want to ask questions, you can just unmute your mic and ask whoever, or you can post a question in the chat. And again, thank you very much. Goodbye from Mr. Patches. <laughs> All right, who has questions? Oh no, do I have to start calling on people? Do I have to pretend no. I'm in class? No, <laughs> no. Lucy, you don't have to call on people. Um, <laughs> I joined late because my session was still um, running. I know, I left started. your session to come to this one. 
Thank you. Um, uh, have students been reaching out to the librarians uh, in to uh, gain information for these research projects that are coming due, you know, in the next week or two? Have you seen an increase, decrease, or is it about the same? I think an increase. I think getting more questions through chat when I'm logged in, and I think more questions in the Ask Us queue. Yeah, I've gotten an increase too in terms of academic based questions. Um, kind of a slight drop off in terms of um, um, people from the public, but you know, it, it goes in waves according to the academic calendar and uh, what people are researching. So you never know. Yeah, I agree. I'm getting a lot, well, not a lot more emails because I always get a lot of emails, but I think more emails from students who at this late stage don't know where to start. I, I think um, the normal rhythm of working on things that have been assignments in some cases that they've had probably for a month or more, things have gotten put aside because of you know the COVID-19 disruption and then suddenly they're in a panic because, oh my goodness, I haven't got a clue where to start this. And those are the students that we really, really try hard to reach, even though I think everyone would agree our greatest pleasure is working with students, graduate students who really know what they're doing and get into deep research. The ones who most need our help are those who come and say, I'm doing research on social injustice. I don't know where to start. <laughs> well, yes, I've had a few students in the past week, as you know, their project was assigned the first day of class and they're supposedly to work through it the entire um, semester. But I have at least two students that say that, you know, no, they they haven't really started um, the real research that they answered questions here and there. So um, I'm glad I'm not the only one. And, and they say it's impossible for them to schedule their lives right now that um, the not having that structure, even though I hold class, that structure of, you know, going to class, going to work, uh, for some reason, it's it's all that time in the world for some of them is difficult for them to then do anything. I always uh, relate this to the bell jar, you know, all those figs in the tree and she can't pick one of them. It's kind of I, I don't mean for it to go to that extent, you know, but it's kind of that reference. Thank you. Well, tell them to reach out to me these last minute research hustlers <laughs> thank you lisa uh, i have mentioned it and sent your email address too i hope they will yeah i had some from your students earlier in the semester but i haven't had any in the last few weeks well i had to say lisa um they may have been students that did their sharing today and uh they're in very good shape and they've used the library more extensively than in past times so um, yes, I've been very impressed with some of the sources they're finding, the information, and the fact that they're going beyond a single answer, that when they get uh, uh, what they think is a possible solution, they're also seeing consequences that they have to deal with in these geologic uh, remediation and environmental cases. So in at least three, I've been very impressed with the fact that they've gone beyond Google, which is where most of them want to stay. So thank you. Good. Other questions? I have a question. Why not? <laughs> Why not? <laughs> um, so as librarians, I know that this kind of hit us really unexpectedly. So I guess, um, how do you find that we were actually surprisingly well prepared for this pandemic? Like, where did you find that the library was surprisingly able to support such a swift change? Well, I'm going to point to my colleague up in the top left corner and say a great deal of that was down to Brooke, who had, before even word of this pandemic came out, organized these shared sites with shared resources, shared PowerPoint, shared lesson plans, because um, I find, as probably most of my colleagues, you know, I make a PowerPoint for every class and send it ahead of time and do all of this planning, but it was all just my stuff. 
And Brooke was the one who really brought all this together in one place so that, say, three of us were teaching for the same instructor in English 1201. We could share our, you know, not reinvent the wheel every time. And also getting us the team's instruction ahead of time so that we were, as I mentioned earlier, like a quarter step ahead of everybody else because we'd already done the training. So that would be my answer to that is kudos to you, Brooke. <laughs> well, I think, <laughs> thank you. Well, I think one of the things that um, I have always wanted to do is is just kind of help us organize what we already have here, because um, it's just kind of it's kind of the just the the ethics of being a librarian is you have a great wealth of information, you have a great wealth of resources, but if people can't access it quickly and efficiently, then it's not really of use to anyone. So it kind of extends to our own um, instructional tools and our own instructional resources. So, um, you know, one of the things when I came on, you know, a year and a half ago was I noticed that we had, you know, these wonderful librarians and that we all had these instructional tools that we were creating, but it made sense to me that we should have a shared database that we could all access of our instructional tools. So that's been something that we've all been working on together as a group um, over the past year and a half. And it just so happened that it served us really well in this particular crisis. And um, so I'm just really happy that <laughs> it worked out <laughs> because if we didn't have that, it would have been a lot harder for us to um, react quickly to this. I'll jump on and say also, um, just with prior experience, um, a lot of my students are already online anyway. So there's a lot of nursing students that are online, MHA students that are online. Um, and of course, a lot of the PhD students um, live further away. So most of my contact with them um, prior to this outbreak has always been through email, phone, or Microsoft Teams. So transition really for me wasn't too bad because I've had those experiences. Um, as well as, you know, the unfortunate experience of having a flood. <laughs> and uh, the IHS had a flood that um, did some damage to the structure of the building, um, making us have to work from home for a while, not as long as what we're, we are currently doing right now. But um, my first instruction was actually through Microsoft Teams because it was in the early or mid-January. So um, I had to teach a complete nursing research methods uh, library introduction course um through microsoft teams so that was my first experience so i had that under my belt um unfortunately i guess <laughs> because of the flood but um so and like i said a lot of their materials electronics uh, on uh, online so um, a lot of my interaction with students is still through email and um calls and stuff so transition wasn't too crazy and i'm like kyle and brooke in terms of um you never know what's going to happen the next day um in terms of archives, it's really a little bit more troublesome in terms of, again, getting primary sources. But, you know, again, I've improvised on various projects over the years, depending upon the circumstance. So, but with our website and our digital collections and other things that are out there, you know, we uh, just try to connect um, students to the proper uh, proper resources. So it's um, preparation was there, but um, we're kind of going with the flow, so to speak. And um, and actually no complaints so far. Has anybody had a complaint? No. <laughs> no. No, I think everybody here should be congratulated for just doing over and above in terms of what helping out the uh, public. So kudos to everybody here. And I think also too, I would just like to say that, um, you know, I I think one of, the, one of the things that we wanted when we planned out this session was to raise up the voices of our students too, because um, this time period for us would have been, um, I have, I personally have gained a lot of meaning in the interactions with students that we have been able to sustain through these remote technologies. And um, the reason that, for example, I chose um, Amanda, I wanted to reach out to Amanda Barba um, to co-present with me was that um, she she was just an example of someone that I think above and beyond we forged a, a connection in a time when um, things were really chaotic and um, 
And I think just our students really shine and our students um, beyond the circumstances, we have really exceptional students and the, being able to support them in this sustained way throughout this has really um, allowed us to continue this meaningful work. And so I, I just think it's it's been so exceptional to see throughout this all of these examples of these exceptional students and, and the really incredible work they're doing, whether it's from the cutting edge COVID research that the students at IHS um, and SHIMS are doing, or whether it's um, you know our, our colleagues at, at the business school who are presenting on a national stage today, um, you know, and the really original research that our undergraduate student Amanda is doing. It's, it's really exceptional and it's been heartening to see this, um, that life continues even during a crisis. So, so kudos to the students. <laughs> And I think this is a good time to remind everybody. I mean, we are in the middle of our Petersheim Academic Expo, which is designed for just that very thing to showcase the work of our students. This is going on all week. And um, just a little plug for starting at two o'clock this afternoon. There is the Petersheim Interdisciplinary Student Presentations starting then if you go to the Petersheim website there's the details of the schedule that normally we would have in person but now is all online so do check that out and support our student research. So true. Are there any other questions? Brooke can you do me a favor can you put the page of uh, our email addresses up so if anyone wants to contact us oh if I'm not, sorry I put Mr. Patches up and cut off the PowerPoint <laughs> <laughs> that's quite all right let me and if you can't find again. it I can desktop let me just um let me just now forget how to operate a PowerPoint at the very end no I'm just kidding <laughs> Okay. <laughs> See, when I need help, I go to expert librarians, so it's all good. <laughs> there we go. Great. Thanks so much, Brooke. So okay. yeah, please feel free to contact us if anybody has questions on a specific discipline uh, type of um, question, or if you want more information about what they're doing. Because again, we have excellent um, librarians here on campus and throughout the library as well, the administration, the staff, and everybody pitching in to help out our community at this time. And I just wanna thank everybody for uh, attending today and for your great support and just being tremendous individuals. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, let me stop recording. Okay. Actually, I can do that. There we go.